Hello everybody and welcome to my geoconvention presentation. I'm going to talk about the top producing wells that have been drilled since the beginning of 2022 in three of my favorite formations, the Cardium, Clearwater and Grand Rapids of the Upper Manville, and the Montney. This is just another legal disclaimer. I'm going to present each of the three formations in reverse stratigraphic order. I'll start by showing where the top wells in each are located in relation to overall drilling and how they compare to the average well. Then I'll get into the geology and some drilling and completion parameters to see if we can discern what makes the top wells the top wells. And I'll start with the cardium. Since January 1st, 2022, 328 cardium wells have been drilled in the basin, with the majority spudded in the Pembina, Willesden, Green, Farrier, Heartland, where oil is the main target. Now, it isn't really fair to the Heartland, but the only wells to break the cardium 1,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day barrier in 2022 and 23 are a handful of tourmaline and pato gas wells at Anderson and Chambers, respectively. These wells benefit from the 6 to 1 gas to BOE conversion ratio, while oil wells do not. The best of the bunch was Tourmaline's 1222-5123 West 5 well at Anderson, coming in at 1,671 barrels of oil equivalent per day, or just over 10 million cubic feet a day, with no reported liquids. Keep in mind that cor Tourmaline's corporate reports indicate that liquids content from this area is significantly higher than zero, testing as high as 724 barrels a day in some wells. It's just a matter of how liquids are reported in public data. Now I also should explain the IP max production metric that we use at CDL. It's a well's highest average daily rate over one calendar month within the first six months of its production life. On this production plot, tourmaline's top wells are red and Pato's are purple. On a BOE basis, these wells are producing at roughly four times the rate of the average cardium well drilled since the beginning of 2022. Despite the similar production, tourmaline and Pato's wells are in somewhat different settings. Tourmaline is targeting the ram barrier sand at Anderson while Pato is targeting the Cardium A shore face sand at Chambers. The Cardium A is also targeted to the north and east at Pembina, Williston Green and Farrier by oil producers, as I mentioned before. So what might be different about these wells compared to the rest of the Cardium? Uh, first off, at Anderson, there's clear evidence of faulting in the Cardium based on multiple occurrences of the cardium appearing on the same log. This little cross section is my interpretation of what's happening there. The section isn't balanced and I didn't have the benefit of seismic that's just is here just to provide a rough idea of displacement. It's more like a schematic. When I started looking at the first chambers wells to come on production in 2020, I couldn't find any evidence of faulting and I wasn't really looking for it or the wells are a little, are there a little further from the deformation front. But as I was frantically clicking on wells to find a set of good logs for an article, I stumbled on this. It's a repeated cardium interval and uh, looks like it's faulted. So what's the big deal with faulting? The idea is that with the rock being shoved around and folded, porosity and permeability enhancing fractures are likely to be present. I can't speak to any potential issues with drilling and well bore stability these faults may cause, but I'd argue that it's not adversely affecting production at Anderson and Chambers, in any case. These maps here show a more zoomed in view of the two areas, with recent wells and the location of the faulted wells I showed on the previous slide. Again, I didn't show any fault traces on here because I have a low certainty as to how they'd actually map, but the top wells and faulted wells are in close proximity, in any case. Uh, 
tourmaline has been the primary operator at Anderson since about, since about 2016 with a wide range of production rates. Pato started its Chambers Cardium program in earnest in 2020, and it's since been joined by a few other operators closer to the north end of the farrier field. Now, I've also wanted to see if drilling and completions played an oversized role in the performance of the top cardium wells. I only used gas wells drilled since the beginning of 2022 to keep the comparison fair. Now on the left hand plot, we see how tourmalines and Pato's top wells have longer than average laterals, but they still outperform wells of similar length. The right hand graph plots completion intensity versus normalized production, and this takes lateral length out of the equation. Again, tourmalines and Pato's top wells don't really stand out in this particular metric. They just simply outperform wells with similar completion intensities. Now this isn't shown on the graph, but tourmaline and Pato are one of the few operators that use ball and seat technology in cardium completions. Coil tubing fracks are much more common. So now we'll move on to the Clearwater and Grand Rapids. Just over 4,500 uh, Clearwater Grand Rapids wells have been drilled since the end of 2021, from Golden down to Eucalta. Now this number is counting each lateral as an individual well. Seven multilaterals broke the 1,000 barrel of oil equivalent per day barrier, and they were all drilled by Baytex at Peavine. The top rate was from 1 of 30, 78 of 15 West 5. It came in at just over 1,200 barrels of bitumen a day from four laterals. Each was approximately 3,000 meters long. On the right is a zoomed in map of the Peavine area with the 2022 and 2023 wells as well as the top producer one of 30 highlighted. On the left we're comparing average rates. The lowest thin green line is the average early production of all clear water wells drilled in 2022 and 2023 to date, and it peaks at about 150 barrels of oil per day. The next higher, slightly thicker line is the average of just the Peavine clear water. It comes in at about 350 barrels per day. Now the thick dark green line, kind of the second one from the top, is just the average of Bay, Texas Peavine oils. This approach is 600 barrels per day. And the thickest bright green line at the very top of the plot is the average of the top seven Bay, Texas Peavine wells. And this jumps past, just jumps past a thousand barrels per day. So stratigraphically, the big difference between Peavine and the other Clearwater plays is that the Peavine wells are actually landed in the Grand Rapids and not the Clearwater, at least as we've interpreted it at CDL. Now we don't all interpret the same way, and Bay Texas wells are even typically licensed as Flair Willrich, which adds another stratigraphic wrinkle. But the rocks don't really care what they're called. The key point is that they're all upper Manville deltaic type sands. In general, the target interval at Peavine appears to be markedly thinner than what's being chased at Martin Hills and Nipissey. This structural cross-section across Peavine helps explain why Bay Texas wells are outperforming other area operators. Bay Texas land is significantly up dip where water production is less of an issue. Uh, Maureen Stornhouse talked a bit more about this at her uh, presentation at the core convention. Here's a detailed, detailed log of the Grand Rapids target at Peavine, along with a map showing the thickness of the target sand in the previous cross-section line. Baytex seems to be in the sweet spot up dip of any wet zones and targeting where the Grand Rapids A sand is at least 8 meters thick. So that explains some of the local variation, but it would be nice to figure out why Bay Texas Peavine wells are outperforming the clear water at Martin Hills and every other area. 
On the left is a porosity perm plot of targets throughout the Clearwater Play from a study CDL did back in 2020. The large red dots are values taken from Grand Rapids A core samples in the immediate vicinity of Bay Texas wells. It's definitely top tier reservoir quality, but remember it's also thinner than that at Martin Hills. Now, the same study, CDL study, showed that higher quality reservoir tended to host more viscous oil. Now, that would be a hindrance to productivity, relatively speaking. And I'd like to be able to show you where Baytex's oil plots on this chart. But there doesn't appear to be any fluid analysis from Baytex as well as in the public domain just yet. This is as of the end of May 2023. And for all we know, if that data becomes available, it might show a trend breaker. Now, Clearwater and Grand Rapids wells aren't completed in the usual sense. Each ladder is lateral is left unfracked. The only real metric I can use for comparison is lateral length, using the top four wells to date from each of the five big area plays. Bay Texas Peavine wells are right in the middle for total lateral length, so that doesn't seem to be a determining factor. Now, on the right, I tried, I guess what I would call a quasi-normalized comparison, which compares production per 1,000 meters to individual lateral lengths. I know it's not the best way to make a correlation. Um, it looks like there might be a bit of a correlation there, or maybe it's a bad one. You can kind of see things trending up to the upper to the upper right. Uh, but in any case, it appears, if this can make any sense, that the longer an operator drills its individual wells, it gets more oil from a given length of well. Um, we'll have to chew on that for a while, but um, it is kind of what that correlation is showing. But right now... We'll move on to the Montney. Almost 1,300 Montney wells have been drilled in the last year and a half, from La Prise Creek in BC down to K-Bob in Alberta. 12 have returned initial rates above 5,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day, and they're all Ovinta wells in the Sunrise area of the Peace River block. Now, two of these wells vied closely for top spot of all time. The two 16 of 30, 79, 17 west of six came on at almost 36 million cubic feet a day with 100 barrels, with 100 barrels of condensate, condensate as well. While one township further south, uh, well 827, 78, 17 west six came on at 36 and a half million uh, cubic feet a day. So just like I did with the clear water, on the right is a zoomed in map of the Sunshine area. 2022-2023 wells are the colored dots and the 5,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day of Vintive wells are the large red dots with the aforementioned top wells labeled. On the left is my graded production chart. The thin orange line on the bottom is the average IP max of all 2022 and 2023 Montney gas wells. They come in at about 4 million cubic feet a day. The brownish red line above that is the average IP max of all 2022-23 sunrise wells. And they're the colored dots on the map. They hit about 10 million a day. So sunrise on its own stands out, stands head and shoulders above the rest of the Montney. The red line is Ovintiv's 2022-2023 sunrise average of all, of all its sunrise wells. And they would come in at 20 million a day, and that's double the area average itself. And the purple lines at the top are the monthly production of the top three Ovintiv sunrise wells to date. Each exceeds 35 million cubic feet a day. Uh, those includes the two wells I've already mentioned, and uh, a third well, three of seven twenty-seven. And that's on the same pad as that 8 to 27 well to the south. Here's a sunrise area Montney cross section using the same internal stratigraphy as Davies et al. used in their CSPG Montney paper from 2018. 
Most of the target horizons in the area are in the upper Montney, but the upper middle and lower middle also host landing zones. All of the 5,000 plus BOE per day wells that I've checked to date target the uppermost part of the upper Montney. Now the interesting part about all this to me, not being much of a petrophysicist, is that the target at the base of the upper Montney looks to have better log qualities, higher porosity and higher resistivity. Now those wells were in the areas where it gets targeted, uh, they still come in pretty good. They come in at about three to 4,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day, which works out to roughly mm, 18 to 25 million uh, cubic feet a day. But they are, those rates are still outclassed by that uppermost Montney target. So when you compare Sunrise overall to other Montney areas, its strong performance can be linked to the Montney's depth and pressure here. But it's hard to figure out, at least from based on that, why Oventive's wells are consistently at the top of the heat. Here's a structure map of the top of the Montney. It's just a consistent dip to the southwest. Oventive's wells are in a relatively narrow structural depth range, but there's nothing else that really jumps out. Now this is a third order residual structure map of the same area where the regional structure has been removed, so to speak, and, and any structural, subtle structural bumps are more easily identified. The map becomes a bit more irregular, but Oventive's wells don't appear to be associated with any particular feature here either. Here's a poor pressure gradient map for the top of the upper middle Montney. Oventive's wells are largely located within a high gradient tongue as high as 17 kPa per meter. It sticks out to the northeast, but so are several other operators with less productive wells. Let's hold on a second. Now this is a map of instantaneous shut-in pressure, or ISIP, the gradient, over the same area. I don't want to get too deep into the intricacies of in-situ stress measurements, but I think I can safely say that ISIP values make a decent proxy for minimum horizontal stress values, even if they are by no means equivalent. So keeping that in mind, this map shows that Oventive's wells are mostly, in this case, within a lower ISIP window horizontal or a horizontal stress window than other area operators. So if you have a high pore pressure, as I showed on the last slide, and a low minimum horizontal stress, this makes for a low effective in-situ stress, which, if all other factors are equal, and admittedly they never are, a frac would require lower energy to propagate and keep open. Or if the same energy was used as that in other areas, an operator would, at least as far as I think about it, have a more permeable frac and higher production. So keeping that in mind, let's look at some completions. So similar to the cardium plots I showed earlier, on the left is a comparison of Sunrise Montney Wells initial production and lateral length, in this case over the last several years. The wells here are colored by zone, not operator, but Oventive's high-performing wells that I've been talking about are the stars. They're relatively long, but not outlandishly so. You'd expect them to be on the higher tier of production, based solely on lateral length, but not head and shoulders above everybody else like they are. On the right, we plotted normalized production per 100 meters of lateral against completion intensity in tons per meter. Oventive's wells, are, they still stand out here in terms of production, but their completion intensity is a bit more in line with other wells. It's entirely conceivable that if effective stress is low around Oventive's wells, using a similar frac program, as well as in areas where effective stress is higher, would yield notably better production results. Now, let me be clear that this is an entirely qualitative observation at this point. So with that, I'm just about ready to wrap up. 
what I learned putting this presentation together is that multiple variables are kind of a headache to work with, but they help make the world beautiful, so you have to deal with them. For the three zones in question, we can conclude that the 2022 cardium overachievers are associated with faulted zones near the deformation front. Baytex P Vine Grand Rapids wells benefit from structure, high quality but relatively thin reservoir, and longer individual laterals compared to other area operators. Ovintive Sunrise Montney production has a potential link to what I'll call a pocket of low effective stress. Um, and just to contradict what I said about said 30 seconds ago in terms of variables giving me a headache, it sure would be nice to have more data. Given that it's harder to find new vertical well logs these days, horizontal open hole logs would be a, one, an example of a great tool to have to assist in well comparisons, especially when there's a lot of variability over small distances. And these sort of logs may well be out there, I just haven't seen many, very many of them to make comparisons with. Here's our contact info. I'd like to thank everybody at CDL for supporting this presentation, in particular Meredy and Steve for their skills in doing this kind of work basically all the time. I'd also like to thank Paul, Allison, and Tessa for doing a lot of, work, a lot of the work behind some of these slides, as well as the graphics and the GIS team, Paul, Svetlana, Lena, and Candice for making the graphics look so good. And a special thanks to Jeff Horton, who's now a Pacific Cambrian, uh, he made my life a lot easier by showing me how to deal with this data properly. And I'd also like to thank you for listening.